and yes, I will be using Comic Sans and PowerPoint. The only thing you need to know is high school math. That means integration and integration by parts. I will also assume that you know what differential equations are, not the, necessarily how to solve them, just what they are. This is not a differential equation. This is a simple second order linear differential equation, and they can get more complicated like the Timoshenko beam or the Navier-Stokes equations. I also assume you know matrix operations, not this matrix, this matrix. They're a great way to write down sums concisely. For example, this is something we will use later. The sum on the left won't be as pretty, but the vector multiplication on the right will be the same. That is literally all the math you need to know to do finite element analysis. So let's get into it. What is a fee? Is the math behind making this thing with the colors, which is the representation of its results. FE is a method with which we can approximate differential equations. These can be one dimensional, so for example, temperature across a bar, two dimensional, for example, stress in a plate, or um, three dimensional, for example, fluid diffusion. So let's get started. Just kidding, we're not getting started before we go through some basics. Starting from the Galerkin approximation. So this guy, back in the 1900s, uh, Boris Galerkin, he was a member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, he got imprisoned for organizing a strike, and then because he was imprisoned, he gave up on all his revolutionary activities and went on to do math, and he discovered this approximation method instead. So you got uh, Boris to thank for this. So let's say we have a differential equation with uh, these boundary conditions. We could solve this analytically, but stick with me, right? Now, we pick any function that satisfies the boundary conditions, let's say this one, and we'll call this the test function. We can pick as many of these as we like, and we'll call them g1, g2, g3, and so on. So then the approximation to f should be some constant alpha multiplied by the test function g. And this, of course, can be written as the sum. Okay, cool. Then we take what is called the residual, that is f minus f tilde, which turns out to be the same as plugging f tilde into the original equation. It turns out if you multiply it with the weight function w and set the whole integral equal to zero, you'll get a very good approximation to f by solving for alpha. Um, so what is W? Well, that's where Galerkin comes in. And Galerkin said W is equal to G. So let's go through this integral then. Here it is. So we need to find R. And we need to find W. Galerkin says W equals G. We plug both of them into the integral. And we get alpha is minus a quarter. Therefore, our approximation is minus a quarter x squared minus x. How cool is that? Well, we can see exactly how cool it is by comparing them. So this uh, approximation versus analytical solution. And this is what it looks like. You can see it's close between 0 and 1, but it's only close between 0 to 1. And that's very important to remember, because if, if we zoom out a bit, the two functions have nothing to do with each other except for that small domain. So that is all for the Galerkin approximation. Now, another basic is shape functions, which are basically a fancy way of saying interpolation. What they do is tell the computer how much of the value at each node contributes to the continuous solution of the problem. These are examples of uh, more nodes per element. So it's still one element, but the approximation is closer because instead of having uh, straight lines, you have curves, and it can be extended to more uh, dimensions as well. Now that that's out of the way, let's look at a simple 1D heat problem. We always start with the boundary value problem, or VVP as they call it in the biz, 
our differential equation and its boundary condition. These are well researched and readily available, but since you asked, here's how we came up with it. Say we have a long fin of length L. We take a small part of it, dx, and look at the energy balance across it. This is the energy balance. Heat in plus external heat times the length is equal to heat out. We rearrange that and we get dh dx is equal to q. Combine that with Fourier's law and we get the differential equation. As for boundary conditions, these can be whatever we want them to be. This means given for all the exam taking nerds here. And we will assume a, k, and q are constant. We now create a weak formulation of the BUP, which will reduce the problem from a second order differential to a first order one. We do this because if we want to approximate it linearly, we cannot have a second order derivative of the approximation because they are zero. So here's our differential equation. We multiply it with a function w, and then we do the weighted residual thing we saw in the basics. So integrate the whole thing and set it to zero. Let's do some algebra to this. Multiply it out and split the integrals. Take this and integrate by parts. And there you have it. That's our weak formulation. And this will work for any w that satisfies the boundary conditions of the BVP. Now, we need to split our domain into elements. Here's our domain, and here are our elements. I'll number them 1, 2, and 3 for later. These elements each have their own local coordinates, x1 and x2. These have the same value for each element if the elements have the same size. So what I mean with this is that if we look at any single element, element e, it will have x1 equals 0 and x2 equals small l. The temperature is expected to change linearly from Ta to Tb. These are called the local nodal values of this element. We can break this up further by saying that the approximation t tilde is the sum of two lines. One of them is ta at x1 and varies linearly to 0 at x2, and the other one is tb at x2 and varies linearly to 0 at x1. These will be ta times n1 and tb times n2, where n1 and n2 are shape functions. These are the formulas for n1 and n2, and using all of this, the approximation t tilde can be written as the sum of nodal values t times the shape function n, that is 1 at node i. Back to the weak formulation. If this is the approximation of t, then we can simply plug it into the weak formulation to find the nodal values. Here's our shape functions. Galerkin says w is an i, just like our basic problem, w is the function we are using to approximate, but without the nodal values, which would be our alpha in the basic problem. So our first term becomes this, our second term becomes this, and note that I did not replace t with a sum here because I do not need to. Instead, I called it the t dx cube. More on that in a bit. The third term becomes this. Wow, this looks like we're doing some big math. This brings us to the Fe equation. This is what we got right now. And what if I told you it can be written like this with zero simple tricks? because there are no tricks, not because they're not simple. Let u be our nodal values, this vector. And we have three elements, so that means four nodes, each with its own temperature, t1, t2, t3, and t4. Then this will be k times u, where k is a matrix with this in it. Still with me? This is called the stiffness matrix. If you've taken a course in FE, you will have heard of this. If you haven't, what the hell are you doing here? The next term, called the boundary vector, technically has this in it, but we don't care. And our load vector has this in it. 
we'll do k and fl first. So let's take it one element at a time. Working with one element just means that the global and local shape functions are the same, so we're not going to run into any trouble. So here's our element, let's call it e. It has a length of small l. These are the shape functions, just to have the handy. k is j is this, so just do the math, you get k is equal to a k over l times 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. Uh, do the same for fl, it becomes ql over 2 times 1, 1. And we will do the boundary vector at a global level later. Let's now assemble the matrix. That means put all the small ones into a big one. So here's our mesh. We number the nodes. And each element has its corresponding stiffness. So 1, 2, 3. And its corresponding load. So 1, 2, 3. Um, then K1 is this, corresponding to nodes 1 and 2. And K2 is this, corresponding to 2 and 3. And K3 is this, corresponding to 3 and 4. So the global matrix will need four items because we have four nodes. We have three elements, but four nodes. So K has as many items as we have nodes. So one, two, three, four. And we just place the small ones in the big one at the right spots. And we also add them up. Put zero at the empty spots. And there's the global matrix. For the load vector, we have something similar, so FL1, FL2, and FL3, but it's the same idea. You put them all together, you make a big one, add them up, and there you have it. Boundary vector. Remember this? Well, forget it. Uh, there are some rules for boundary vectors. This is basically zero at internal nodes, some of it is given by boundary conditions, and whatever is not given by boundary conditions, we'll just call it R. Here's our mesh, and these are our boundary conditions. So T at zero is 100. That has nothing to do with our boundary. Our boundary is Q and I. Remember, Q is dt dx. So we know that Q at x equals L is zero. So our boundary vector at node number four will be zero. So here's our boundary vector. We don't know what this is. This is an internal node. This is an internal node. And this is given by the boundary condition. All that's left is to find our u. So here's the problem again, our boundary conditions. u is 100 at node 1. So at node 1, we have 100. And the rest, we don't know. So u2, u3, and u4. Putting it all together. Here's our phi equation, plug in everything we got before, throw it into MATLAB, and this is the answer that we get, 100, 102.5, 104, 104.5. And these are values corresponding to nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we can plot this, and this is what it looks like. So the, the red line is our approximation. I also included the exact solution just to compare. Um, in fact, the nodal values are exact because the exact solution is quadratic and our approximation is linear. This is true for um, whenever your exact solution is one order higher than your approximation. And that's about it. Thank you for watching.